Steve Garvey is a Major League Baseball legend and now a rising figure in the political arena. He's a 10-time All-Star, a two-time National League Championship Series MVP, and a World Series champion. Over his 19-year career with the Los Angeles Dodgers and the San Diego Padres, Steve earned the nickname Mr. Clean for his remarkable consistency and sportsmanship. Now he's running for the United States Senate seat in California, previously held by the late Dianne Feinstein. The one thing, like I said, that brings us together is sports. And if we think of politics as a sport, why can't we use the same ingredients to bring politicians together? Steve and I digged into one of baseball's best rivalries, the New York Yankees and Los Angeles Dodgers, starting with the 1977 World Series in my hometown, New York City. The boogie down Bronx was crazy back then, on fire. It was fueled with fear from the serial killer Son of Sam, the birth of Studio 54, Mr. October Reggie Jackson, and Tommy Lasorda's love for New York City nightlife. It was East Coast versus West Coast. It was uh, the characters as the managers, but great baseball men. And I think that that was why Yankee Dodgers have always been the epitome of a World Series, just because of the history of the personalities and the engagement of the two great cities of New York and Los Angeles. Steve later argued why Pete Rose should be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Frankly, in my opinion, Steve should be in the Hall of Fame too. Politically, Steve Garvey is in a dogfight to improve our quality of life. Over the past three and a half years, California has experienced an increase in food and gasoline costs, homelessness, crime, and anti-Semitism. Steve's modern approach to government also takes the environment into consideration. It was my honor having Steve Garvey, the United States Senate candidate for California, join me on this episode of Some Future Day. Steve Garvey, it is such an honor and pleasure to have you join me today on Some Future Day. How are you? Thanks. And thanks for having me. We have mutual friends uh, uh, that we uh, love dearly and got us together, and I look forward to it. Absolutely. Alan Hamill and Suzanne Summers, the late, great Suzanne Summers, wonderful, wonderful salt of the earth people. But, um, Steve, I understand, although you're a California person and you're a West Coast guy for most of your career, that you have roots here in New York. Yeah, Long Island, uh, Glen Cove, Hempstead, uh, Wanta, uh, oh, wow. Uniondale, uh, you know, families' uh, roots were there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I chatted briefly that, uh, ironically, my, uh, my grandfather on my father's side was a, a Brooklyn policeman. So... Um, you know, the history goes deep. I remember uh, it's a longer story, but uh, uh, we ended up in, in Florida, my dad and mom and my uh, mom's uh, parents, my grandparents. And uh, so every year at Thanksgiving time, my mom and dad would take uh, their vacation. We'd go up to New York and spend five or six days. And grandpa would uh, would always take my dad and I to Abbott's Field, and he knew all the guys there, and they would let him in. Of course, it was a Pretty chilly at Thanksgiving in New York at that time. Some years there'd be snow on the, the iconic uh, Hebbets Field. Other times the pigeons would be flying around and it'd be a decent temperature. But you could feel the ghosts of, of Abbott's Field and, and the great Brooklyn Dodgers. And you could almost hear the, the echoes of the Giants and Dodgers in, in 51 and the Yankees playing the Dodgers, what, five or six times at least at Abbott's Field. So I kind of grew up with a uh, basic understanding of... Uh, of the Dodgers. Mom was a Yankee fan, so she gloated a lot back then. But right. uh, starting in uh, 1956, uh, we had moved down to Tampa, Florida. Uh, my dad was a Greyhound bus driver, and he came home in late March, which is spring training time. And uh, mom had dinner, and I was sitting down. Dad came in and immediately looked at me. He said, do you want to skip school tomorrow? And I said, Dad, wow, why? He said, well, I got a charter tomorrow to pick up the Brooklyn Dodgers from the Tampa airport. Wow. They'd flow over from... Uh, Vero Beach spring training to play the Yankees in an exhibition game. Well, uh, dad and two other gentlemen had just started the second little league in Tampa and uh, we were going to start four days later. Uh, and I had my brand new Rawlings heart of the high glove. And, uh, I said, dad, really? He said, yeah. He said, maybe you'll get a chance to bat boy. Well, 
the next day it all came together. It's a longer story of, of meeting Campanella and Hodges and Ferrillo and Jackie Robinson and Snyder and getting a chance to bat boy wow. and uh, falling in love with the game that night. So um, it's amazing the course of history that, uh, that God puts us at. Yeah, I mean, you know, obviously you're legendary and uh, the teams that you played on, not just the Dodgers, the Padres too, are, are, you know, to a certain extent legendary. I know it's not the Yankees. Um, I say that with love, but, and being a little facetious, but. Well, let's um, talk about those know, mutual victories uh, with the Dodgers and Yankees. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, before we go there, you mentioned Jackie Robinson and yep. I was, you know, it's kind of interesting because um, I didn't realize that you had that experience with Jackie Robinson. And I was thinking how like, you you know, for me in my li entire lifetime, my, my dad, my grandfather, like baseball has always inspired us and instilled a sense of pride sure. in my family. Yeah. Um, and then if you look at like America, it's done so like through the Civil War, through uh, World Wars, it goes on and on and on. And, you know, baseball really did do a lot in pushing America's culture forward. For example, when you mentioned Jackie Robinson, it really helped to a certain extent with integration and to defeat a certain level of racism mm -hmm. in the United States of America. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, like from your perspective, like who, who in baseball most inspired you as it relates to those types of like social justice issues that, that you, um, you know, I guess experienced also. Yeah. So I just, you know, I spoke at a, a fundraiser in Bakersfield, California last night. Uh, the ranchers and the and the uh, farmers and the oil men there, uh, big Dodger fans, bunch of giant fans, which was always the great rivalry, whether it was yeah. East Coast or West Coast. And I talked briefly about the one true constant in America over the last 150 years has been baseball. If you think about it, uh, the beginnings of baseball in the uh, 1800s, and the evolution of the game and the emergence of, of Babe Ruth and the Yankees. And then, uh, ironically, um, it really went with uh, the turning became with Branch Rookie, Ricky, and his development of the minor league system when he owned the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. And, of course, we know when uh, on April 15, 1947, uh, Jackie Robinson took the field opening day and broke the color barrier. And just like you said, you look at uh, turning points in America, and that day was a defining moment. And of course, you know, there was just society itself dealing with integration, segregation. But I think the, uh, the spotlight was on baseball. And when I look at my years with the Dodgers and I, and I look at the players that I, great players I played with and against, there's, no, there's not been a sport that's been as inclusive as baseball. If you, you look throughout the years, obviously, but look through all sports. Uh, and today, take the, the Dodgers, for example. Uh, black men, you know, white men, uh, Asians, uh, Hispanic, uh, a true blending of America. And, I, and like I said last night, I mean, you know, you can you can go to Japan and live there and not be Japanese. You can go to China, you go to Germany. But when you come to America and you come here the right way and you integrate into uh, America, you become an American, regardless of your history and your you know initial culture. So uh, that's why I love baseball so much, that I was a part of it for 20 years, part of the great Dodger organization. And uh, five of those 20 years uh, were spent in San Diego uh, building history with that great franchise that had a whole different story of, of coming of age in 1969 and having this iconic businessman by the name of Ray Kroc by the team and, uh, and start to begin the history there. So, you know, I've been blessed. I've been blessed to reach the the heights of the mountain, beating those Yankees in 81 and uh, falling off a few times in 77, 78, obviously. Uh, but uh, I think when it's all said and done, it's uh, it's the fiber of America. And like you were saying, it's also local so and territorial. So if you live in the New York area or, of course, like the history of the Yankees, you that will be part of, of your history and your families and likewise sure, yeah. for yeah. the other 30 teams, 29 teams. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting, um, Steve. Like you're, you've seen so much, and you've you've um, you grew up uh, with Major League Baseball during such interesting times. The fact that you highlight how on the field it's been so diverse and and almost like a melting pot is interesting. Something I was talking about with one of my friends here in New York City. We get the sense that. 
uh, New York City and perhaps even the United States today is more divided um, than in my lifetime by, by religion, by race, by gender and beyond. But yet, if we go to Yankee Stadium, and I'm sure the same thing would apply if you were in Dodger Stadium and you're in the, fan, you're, you're in the, in the seats watching the athletes, next to me is, again, this massive melting pot, people from all different backgrounds, ethnicities, um, sure. and we're all, we're all rooting for the same team. We're all friends. But yet, when we leave the stadium, we start to hate each other again. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen that phenomenon, but maybe, maybe there's something to it. Like maybe someone like you, a true leader, a, a United States Senate candidate, should um, think in terms of like, why is it that these these fans could sit in these stadiums every, you know, every day basically, and they're best of friends. They're all together. They're all aligned. And then the second we leave, we get back into like this weird, uh, tense hate mode. Well, you know, I, as my career developed in September 1st of 1969, uh, I was called up to the Dodgers. That's when they, the teams are allowed to bring four or five minor league players up. So Bobby Valentine from Stanford, Connecticut, and Tom Short from Ham Shamrick, uh, uh, Michigan and Billy Buckner from Vallejo, California, and Bobby, you know, and myself all came up, and it shows the diversity of of, of areas and, and cultures. You know, an Irishman, an Italian, <laughs> another boy of Polish descent. Um, yeah. But but that's what, like I said, through the years, the constant has been baseball, and it's the one thing that has tied people together and been the fiber of of, of cities and and uh, in this country is. Uh, you attach yourself to the team. And the great thing about baseball is for 180 days, 162 games in about 180 days with off days and so forth, and then the playoffs, you get a chance to wake up in the morning and see how your team did. And, and you attach yourself, obviously, to the team. Uh, but then there are individual players that you like. And just like last night, you know, men came up to me in their 60s and said, I want to thank you. I grew up with you, and you set an example for me. And hard work and dedication and sportsmanship. And I said, that's the ultimate compliment for those of us that play the games, that we affected people in, in a positive way. And I've always said, you know, we're in the memory business and uh, people will come up and, uh, and say, oh, I remember going with my grandfather and sitting in the bleachers at Dodger Stadium. And those were the best of times. And we would have hot yeah. dogs together and peanuts. And grandpa would teach me about the game and how I became a fan of it. And, and uh, yes. even to today, and now I keep score, which probably is the ultimate <laughs> fan engagement yeah. there. But that's what baseball does. And and I think that through the years when I would I would sit in the stadium or stand in the stadium during, especially pitching changes, which can be boring, and I'd look up, and, and different nights would have different uh, uh, different cultures to them. You know, Friday night would be. Uh, uh, the end of the week, you know, Thursdays, you know, thank God it's Thursdays, chance to get out early. And Saturdays would be date nights and Sundays would be family day. And, you know, probably Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday would be the season ticket holders that were were there and, and part of the anchors. So, uh, you know, I always say, I, and even though I played football at Michigan State and loved football and yeah. basketball as a kid, baseball uh, was the one sport that I, I think I was very blessed to play and who played with the greats because I was in that transitional period of uh, the 60s into our group that was probably 70 to, to 90, uh, that era. But the mm -hmm. Mantles and, and the Mays and the, the Marises and, um, you know, those were the guys that were from the late 40s, 50s into the 60s who were just happening to, to linger on. That I had a chance to play with them for, you know, a couple of years in the early 70s. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, did you, when you use the word hard work, I know that you in particular were um, an extremely hard worker, really diligent on the field, um, especially with your, um, I guess we could say like your Ironman streak. I think it was about 1,200 games, yeah. a little bit more than that, right? That was like incredible. incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And then didn't you go, um, was it a full season with the Dodgers where you never missed a game? Was that was that it or or more than that, I would imagine? That. Yeah. Well, seven and a half years straight, I didn't miss a game. 1,207 right. uh, consecutive games. Uh, the National League record, number four all time. Uh, awesome. Behind, of course, you yeah. know, Cal Ripken and uh, uh, Lou Gehrig uh, and Everett Scott. Not too many people ever heard of Everett Scott, but he was another first baseman that played, I think, about. 1100 games, but, uh, yeah. And I took a lot of pride in it. When people say, uh, what accomplishment, uh, has been the most important to you? And I said, well, if you play a team sport, 
to win a world championship is is the ultimate because it's 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 the team effort. It's a long journey from the beginning of spring training to that la- final out. And, uh, and of course, we did it at Yankee Stadium, which people say um, was that important. I said it was. I mean, we could have done a Dodger Stadium in front of our home fans. That would have been great. But if we couldn't to do it at Yankee Stadium, and especially with my roots, family being from from Long Island in New York, and Grandpa being a a Brooklyn policeman, uh, right. to have done it there was uh, was very fitting for that chapter of my life that culminated with winning a world championship. But but really on a day to day basis, individually, the consecutive game streak made a statement for my commitment to uh, to the game, uh, to the fans. Uh, obviously the Dodger organization, and then probably the last 15 of those uh, consecutive games were in San Diego. But uh, but going from a, a bat boy at the age of seven and doing that for probably six, seven years in spring training uh, to reaching the heights of the game of baseball um, says a lot for not only sports in America, but uh, about our society. Uh, that sure. just like you and I are talking about, what, what weaves us together uh, as people uh, is sports. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, Cal Ripken Jr. was a client of mine for a long time as he went into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. And Cal, similar to you, um, was positioned where it, he was in between the old and then the next generation, A-Rod and Jeter and those guys. And I remember with I was with Cal at one point and he was talking about how you inspired him um, as it relates to work ethic and, and all. It was a, a very memorable conversation with me uh, with, that I had with Cal, Steve, do you, if you look back to the generation before you, I mean, those names are, are just incredible that you named, yeah. were any of those people or any of those athletes, uh, specifically inspirational to you as it relates to your work ethic or perhaps even overcoming adversity? Because I know I could imagine for years and years to be on the field, there must've been those moments in time where you're like, I just, I'm not up for it today. I need a break. This injury is nagging me and I can overcome adversity. And maybe it was one of the guys that preceded you that inspired you? Well, you know, when I was growing up and I was an only child, yeah, it's, it's ironic. I have seven children, seven grandchildren now. So, and a lot of daughters, which balanced me out. Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> thank you. We're just Very here to nice. serve, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I would, when I was growing up to, to be able to sit on a bench when I was bat boy with, with those iconic Dodgers. So Gil Hodges was, was very special, a lot like my dad, six, three, a uh, very strong guy, good family man, uh, you know, quiet to a sense of, of how we catch him studying the field. I remember one time on the bench, he was, he had Pee Wee Reese next to him. And uh, again, it was the end of spring training, a meaning, meaningless exhibition game. And he was watching the Yankee pitcher on how he would wind up. And if he, if he had his fingers this way, it would be a fastball. And if he did turn his hand this way, it'd be a curveball. So instead of talking about where they were going to dinner that night or uh, did, uh, are you all set for the season with a, an apartment in Brooklyn, they were talking about the possibility of facing this pitcher in, in, in the World Series in October. And if Amazing. the game was on the line, recent Hodges would know that if he started to wind up like this, it was going to be a curveball. And that one little uh, little advantage could be in the game. So it was a it was a great example of um, not wasting time, taking advantage of, of when you're at a game, especially if you're playing, to watch the field, uh, watch the opposition. Remember how they pitched you, you know, if you're a batter, how Amazing. they got you out, how they pitch uh, the guys in front of you who might be comparable in terms of power and the type of hitter. So if you were to say, uh, what was the one virtue that I think uh, really was a reason for my success and longevity, is that my my true interest in watching those people that were successful, watching, uh, because the game is so difficult, uh, what you're given, in other words, in terms of maybe a pitcher, how the outfield uh, outfielders are playing, so that you can take advantage of the situation, put it in your memory bank, and, and uh, use it when the time is appropriate. The athletes who have the great talent and ability but, but can't think their sport are usually ones that fall short in reaching their potential. Others who may not have have the same amount of, of, of physical ability, but really study the game and analyze it and, and put that into their memory bank and execute it when, when the lights are on, so to speak, are the ones that sustain, have longevity, and you admire, admire because they have a, a complete game, both mentally, physically, and spiritually. 
That's so interesting to me, that intellectual piece of it. Which other um, professional baseball players during your generation do you think had that heightened level of intellect as it, as it applied to the game, where they were able to get an advantage because they were so intelligent on the field? Yeah, you know, there's there are a number of them, obviously, but Hank Aaron was one that I watched. I got a chance to play against Hank. I was on the field for 715. Uh, which was a monumental moment and a wonderful moment wow. in my, my career in life. Uh, and Willie Mays, watching Willie Mays at the end of his career, somehow, some way, uh, getting to a ball he probably shouldn't have, but because of his experience and his mental ability and, and, and acuity, he would get to a ball. He robbed me a few times. So uh, <laughs> even at 39-40, he wasn't that old. He made up for it with that mental ability. But uh, P. Rose was another one who got a tremendous amount out of what was, you know, probably average to a little better than average physical ability, but he, he worked so hard and you know what? He had probably two consecutive game streaks of over 700 games. So he was right up there with those of us who, who thought it was important to play every day and almost every inning. Uh, but Pete would, he was thought the game he, he so like well. He beat his body up. Yeah. And he, and he did. He did. Yeah. Those head first slides mm-hmm. take their throw. Uh, but yeah. I think of if I, if it was somebody who didn't have the great ability of the gentleman I just mentioned, but maximize that to arguably have more records than anyone, and probably when it's all said and done, should be in the Hall of Fame. Um, was was somebody? So I watch and I watch pitchers. I watch pitchers who would go out every day. Watch the Bob Gibsons and the Tom Seavers and Jim Palmers and men like that, and and how they would set up hitters. And, and think about when I did face them. And a lot of those you know, guys I, I would face in all-star games or probably or possibly postseason. But, um, you know, and, and we learn from our professions. The more we study it, uh, the more we, we watch the people that are very good at what they do. Uh, and to be around, for me, be, to be around Vince Scully and, uh, and uh, Al Michaels and people like that. And I've, I've done enough uh, in terms of, of media and radio and television to see how they approach the game. And, um, and, and, and I said this last weekend, we had a great weekend in, in Los Angeles. Uh, on a Friday night, Dusty Baker was uh, inducted into our Legends of Dodger Baseball, which is the Dodger Hall of Fame. And I was honored to be a part of the first class. And then on uh, Saturday, we had 35 Dodger Legends on the field. And I was sitting wow. there and looking around. And the only other time that I felt comparable was to be back for a couple of uh, Yankee old-timer games. Um, you don't see any games anymore because we're truly old-timers. <laughs> uh. And we, uh, we can't get out there. But I think it's, you know, people seeing these legends, whether it's Dodgers or Yankees, uh, one more time. And to elicit those memories that have been the fiber, like I said, of, of people's lives uh, is, is, uh, is so special to see. Uh, but sure. also... To listen to Ben Scully for sixty three years, uh, and and the yeah, Al Michaels and all the all the great ones, and every team has them, uh, become part of your family and uh, have a great influence on us. Steve, you, you may, I heard you um, in an interview before a talk about Pete Rose. You, in one interview, this goes back maybe 10 years, you had said Pete Rose was the most competitive, like the best athlete that you ever uh, faced on the field. Competitive, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, you, you had mentioned just now that he should be in the Hall of Fame. Why don't they just put him in the Hall of Fame already? Like, is, is there something bizarre about that when it seems like there are other people that have been inducted by the selection yeah. committee that um, perhaps could be, um, you know, they have an asterisk, right? They could, they could sure. be sidelined like Rose. Like, why don't they just put the guy in? Well, you know, there's, uh, there's P. Rose on the field and off the field, and he's always had this wonderful, almost childish personality that's very engaging, and, you know, we love him for that. And, of course, he had a problem with gambling, obviously, an addiction to it. Uh, he made mistakes, and, uh, and he paid for them. You know, in our society, when, uh, when we, you know, when we fail, and, and in his case, you know, Brock broke, you know, rules with, with baseball and so forth, um, and we get the opportunity to pay our dues and we pay those dues. We, we, we give back to that debt to society. I think we should be allowed to, um, to get back into uh, a situation where we can resurrect ourselves by, by how we live the rest of our lives and, and how we learn from our mistakes. 
And, uh, and I think Pete's done that. So especially at a time when, uh, when all sports are invested in gambling, which I think is ironic. And, and when I say vested, owning 25% of gambling entities like FanDuel and DraftKings and, and now Good you point. have MGM Sports and all these things. You know, I think it's time to, to allow him to be on the ballot and uh, to let him be voted on. And uh, if, if there are known steroid users that probably are in the Hall of Fame now, which yeah. I think uh, put a tremendous stain on, on baseball for that period of, say, the end of 80s till 2004 or 5, uh, then it's time for him to go on the ballot and be voted on. Yeah, I think so, too. I think the selection committee seems like from an outsider's perspective to have poor judgment, because honestly, like your career is just immensely. I mean, the achievements that you had, you'd come into Yankee Stadium and I was afraid of you, Steve. I was like, oh, God, this guy's going to kill us every single time. I think even in like 1977, game six, first inning, you already like slapped me around and like, <laughs> right, you, you you hit that. Um, I think it was like a uh, you drove in one run. It was yeah, maybe a, triple, a double or triple something. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Triple right. Yeah, triple right. Triple, exactly. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I'm not going to ask you to comment on it, but I think it personally, I think it's absurd that you're not in the Hall of Fame. It, it's to yeah. me, that's just absurd. Thanks. Uh, yeah. and, it's absurd, and maybe this really. is the year. Maybe this is the year I'll uh, I'll win the uh, the magnificent double of uh, my U.S. Senate race and going in the Hall of Fame. In December, I'll be, be on the ballot again. And you know, I may be I may have the most times being on a ballot of any player in history. I think Gil Hodges just had that. There, there are so many athletes that are yeah. There are fantastic uh, athletes in the Hall of Fame, but there are so many that don't have the career that you had, like not just with, you know, ending up in, in the fourth place with regards to most consecutive games played, but, you know, MVP, all-star appearances, your batting average, like everything is just there, like full yeah. on, like amazing defensive, Golden Glove winner, just an incredible, incredible athlete. Steve, right. let's go to the New York City, let's go to Yankees-Dodgers rivalry just for a second because sure. we touched on it, if we may. So like, um, I always thought from and again, a Yankees perspective, I was like, wow, that guy, Tommy Lasorda is wild. Like I would look at him and I'd be like, we have, we have Billy Martin. We have like craziness on our side, but those guys like are equally like, they're right there with us. Like yeah. Tommy Lasorda is in crazy, is, is an incredible person. And I remember he used to always say, you gotta believe he was like so inspirational. So I was curious, like, could you share a story maybe that you haven't shared before about Tommy Lasorda? He's like such a special iconic person. And I was thinking like, what? What story could you think of off the cuff? Like, was there anything like really hysterically like funny or just totally wild that you didn't expect that Lasorda did while you guys were traveling or something? Well, you know, um, a lot of us, when we signed, uh, like I said, Valentine, Buckner, Shork, and I uh, went to Ogden, Utah, where Tom was managing that. And it was, uh, 68 was his third year at Ogden. He had been a scout. He had been a journeyman pitcher. He always said his claim to fame was he was on the Dodger roster in 1955 uh, when the Dodgers signed Sandy Koufax and gave him, I think, $2,000. Well, the rule was then that if you signed a bonus contract for 2000 you had to be put on the major league team uh, for the season. So lo and behold, they signed him for $2,000. And who do they take off the roster who finally made it was Tommy Lasorda. So Tommy... I would always say that the reason for Koufax's success is that he let him go on to the <laughs> roster and he I graciously went down to, uh, to triple a, but, uh, you know, but Tommy, I mean, from the beginning, um, his enthusiasm, his love for the game, love for the Dodgers, uh, was contagious. And I think that era, like I said, from 70 to, especially with the Dodgers to 85, a big reason was that many of us were Tom's, Tom's boys. And of course, the iconic Walter Alston was there until '77. And and you talk about you talk about management styles. Walt was was six three, strong, um, relatively quiet, uh, that silent leader. Uh, if he said, "I want to talk to you," it meant that he had studied something or watched something, and he was going to say something in relatively few words that was going to make you a better player, a better person, or. Like with Bill Buckner, he had such a temper that Walt would talk to him once in a while about how to control that temper to, to, to put your energy to on the field instead of doing things extraneously. So, um, but Tommy, as time went on, he became like a, a second father to all of us. But uh, a couple of us were always the, uh, 
the players that he would want with him late at night when we'd come into, say, Chicago and uh, and would be on the bus. And Tommy would say, hey, Garth, uh, get Russell and Hooten and stay back, you know, and then come with me and uh, we're going to get something to eat, which was always the code word. We were going to an Italian restaurant that probably had <laughs> 50 to 100 people who would be waiting That's for crazy. us for a six course meal uh, by, at one o'clock in the morning. And he Amazing. would do this in Chicago and New York, especially because uh, uh, Jilly, Jilly's in in, uh, in Chicago, New York, uh, New York. Of course, Tom knew uh, Frank Sinatra quite well. So this one time we come in, we played the Pirates. We we're on a pretty good streak. We get in, we have this dinner. I look up, it's three thirty. I said, "Tom, we got to play the Cubs tomorrow in a day game at one o'clock. We got to get just a few more minutes." So now we get back uh, to wow. the uh, Hilton at four thirty in the morning. Got to get up at eight. It's one of those hot July days in Chicago, and the warm air is, is is blowing in from off the lake. And batting practice, and we're sweating, and now the game, you know, we, we, we're standing there for the national anthem. And uh, and I feel like I'm underwater. And I look at, <laughs> at uh, Russell, and he's looking at me, Mike. Uh, and, uh, and we're standing there, we have our, our hats over our hearts, and Tom looks at me, I'm next to him, he says, you don't look very good. I said, I don't look very good. I said, you kept me out till 4.30. I had to get out, really, at 7.30. I come out here, it's 90 degrees, humidity is 80, and, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel great either. He says, listen, he said, get a couple of hits, drive in some runs. You can go back to the hotel, and, and you can go to bed. I said, it's Chicago. I'm not, I don't want to go back to bed in Chicago. <laughs> we only have five off nights on the road all year long. I want to go out. And he started laughing. He was chewing out his tobacco. But that was Tommy. So he was like the social leader too then, huh? Yeah, he was the P.T. Barnum of baseball. It was, uh, it was a three-ring uh, circus with Tommy. It was uh, on the field actions, uh, off the field dealing with the press and, and, and the fans. Uh, and then, you know, Tommy himself, um, understanding that his destiny was to be a manager. And lo and behold, this journeyman pitcher ends up being in the Hall of Fame. What an incredible, incredible human being. Yep. So it's funny, like the summer of 77, in comes this Los Angeles Dodger team, um, incredible powerhouse team. Meanwhile, for us, it's the Bronx is burning. You might remember like Son of Sam, the serial killer is like Great all document. over the news. I was afraid of the Son of Sam. We had blackouts, we had fires. And I'm just like thinking about like, culturally baseball was probably different there. Like you guys are, are thinking like, we're gonna go in, we're gonna beat Reggie Jackson and these guys, but we're gonna enjoy New York City too. And I think Studio 54 opened that spring in the <laughs> spring. I think it's April of 77. So I'm curious, Steve, like during the World Series, did you guys go out at night? Were you guys like, we're in New York City, we're like these cool, beautiful looking LA guys, let's let's take advantage of it. It was a different day and age, I know, but like, did you guys go out? I like that depiction. You know, cool looking guys, pastel. You were. From the coast. <laughs> no. Uh, um, it, it's true, know, it's we, true. We had been frustrated in 74, uh, even that we were very young in 74. I had just started playing first base in 73 and, and, uh, Lopes and Russell and say and myself, which formed arguably the greatest in field in history. And then we, we picked up a Jimmy Wynn and so forth, but we, we were too young. 77, we were, you know, starting to get into our prime. And I always have always said 77 team was probably the best team I ever played on. Would put teams away by the fourth inning pitching staff was solid reliever. But, uh, by the, by the time that we had, uh, realized that we were going to play the Yankees. It was very special for me. And I would talk to the guys in, in history and the writers would write about the history and the old writers in New York were still around, you know, Dick Young, Red Foley and those guys. Like I said before, if the players are the author of the game by what we did on the field, the poets are the writers and, uh, and the press and the radio and TV announcers that, that brought us to life in, in, in terms of, of human beings and so forth. But uh, but that was, and you know, Peter Goober did a great uh, 30 on 30 uh, called the Uncivil War, uh, Yankees versus Dodgers, focusing on 77, 78, and then uh, very proud of him, thankfully, because he's a part Dodger owner now of, uh, of making sure he got the 81 World Championship in. But it was yeah. so very special, and, and there were so many components, and, and Peter used Reggie Jackson as, as the Yankee 
you know, personality and he used me as the antithesis and West Coast guy and so forth. And that's really the way the two teams were. It was East Coast versus West Coast. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, the characters as the managers, but great baseball men, great X's and O's Amazing. guys. Amazing. It was the and best. Then, it was really the best. And, and Steinbrenner, you know, he, he was another personality that, that, that fed, you know, this rivalry. So we had everything. And, and to this day, I, every year, I, people say, who, do you, who are you picking? I said, I hope it's Yankees, Dodgers, and the World Series yeah, because there's awesome. no better. Steve, I want to move on to your um, campaign. But before I go, I just have to ask you one question, really for self-serving purposes. Sure. Um, did you have a chance to get to know Thurman Munson? I always was so enamored with Thurman Munson for so many different reasons. And, you know, um, although he was the captain, big personalities like Reggie Jackson really dwarfed him in certain ways. And I'm curious if, if you knew him. And if so, what was he like as a person? Uh you know, we, we talk from time to time because, again, being contemporaries and having a tremendous amount of respect for each other, being uh, more of a quiet leaders. Obviously, um, uh, at first base, you don't have the same engagement as, as a catcher does in leadership, like Roy Campanella was with the Dodgers. You always think of Pee Wee Reese as being the captain, but Roy Campanella was just as much a captain as, as Pee Wee Reese. Um, so I admired how he handled himself, uh, how he played the game the quiet leadership, uh, the things he did uh, that uh, would bring out an affection by the fans because it was a hard-working, blue-collar approach to the game. I think he was from Ohio, and I think he was a great example, if you were a father, to say, okay, son, watch Thurman Munson, how he plays the game. And, and I think that goes back to Pete Rose when I, I talk about peace dedication. I've always said, if you were a father and you wanted your son to pick one person to watch on how the game should be played, it was probably Pete. But Thurman was up there the same way. And I think that the reason for their success, and, and, and I say this in 77, the three home runs, obviously, and so forth, but I, I think that we had every reason to win that World Series, and probably because of, of their leadership, uh, we didn't. And, um, and magic moments. Oh, that's interesting. But um, that's again, I think that that was why Yankee Dodgers have always been uh, the epitome of of, uh, of a World Series is because of the history of the personalities and the engagement of the two great cities of New York and Los Angeles. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So it's interesting because baseball, I think, maybe used to be America's pastime. But in this day and age, maybe politics has become America's pastime. It seems like every part of my life, whether it's going to the baseball game, going to the restaurant, in my classroom, in my career, it's politics, politics, politics. Steve, has politics become America's pastime? That's a great question. Um, I'm working on a book now uh, called When Sports Became Politic and Politics Became Sport. And uh, I think that's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, if you think about it, sports has become so political. Um, and politics is, is truly a sport. If you think about it, if you think about a campaign like my campaign against uh, Adam Schiff, I mean, this is a sport. This is, is, is two, two starting pitchers and a great team around them uh, trying to, uh, to knock out the opposition. Uh, and I think that all the, all the skills and, and, and all of the competitiveness you learn playing sports. And I, and I wonder sometimes about Congress, has anybody played a team sport in Congress? <laughs> Have they all been golfers and tennis players and bowlers that they can't get together for the sake of America and, uh, and can, can talk about different policies, but come together for the good of this great country. And I, I've, I've been preaching this throughout my campaign now because you know, it, the one thing, like I said, that brings us together is sports. And if we think of politics as a sport, why can't we use the same ingredients to bring, you know, politicians together on both sides of the aisle for the sake of their individual districts and, and, uh, and states in this country for the good of, of preserving our country? Because if I can just mention this briefly, we've been to the Hoover Institute a couple of times now and spent six hours and had great presentations from Condoleezza Rice and General Mattis and, and General Ellis and, and the top educational minds uh, that tell us that the two things right now that, that are 
that are most demanding is number one, we've, we've never been in more danger uh, than we are now, both domestically and, and, uh, and around the world. Uh, nor do we have a lack of leadership now of people who, uh, who have been running for power and money when they should be running for the people and the voice of the people. So, um, you know, we could probably talk about that, but that's why, you know, I've been conceptualizing and, and putting this book together because they have become so similar uh, that it's about America in, in the 21st century. Yeah, it seems to me, unfortunately, that a lot of politicians today are there for their own fame because they want to become rich rather than the old fashioned way of really serving the community. And you talk about your competitor, Representative Adam Schiff. I mean, he was the 25th lawmaker in history of the House to be censured. And yet it seems like it's not covered in the news. I haven't seen it anywhere. I did a deep dive in in, uh, California local media. Nobody talks about it. And it's almost like the citizenry doesn't care that he was censured for lying over and over and over again about the um, uh, Trump-Russia situation or Russia hoax, right? That's what everybody calls it. Mm -hmm. But but why, why... I guess my question is twofold. A, do you agree with this assessment? Like the new politicians are are doing it mainly for um, uh, themselves. Like they want to become rich. They want to be famous, uh, maybe AOC and these types of people. And then on the second side of it, do you think people are just happy to look the other way? They don't care if their own representative has been censured for lying over and over and over again? I I, I think that you have have struck the nerve that... that, uh... It's probably the reason I decided to run. Um, probably about 14 months ago, I uh, woke up one morning, turned the TV on, and uh, and saw a dysfunctional Washington snarkiness between um, politicians who were supposed to be working for the people and working to build consensus. And, uh, and we've seen this for a long time now. And uh, I tapped my wife on the shoulder and, and I said, honey, and she's a pretty savvy gal, love my life. And knowing that the Feinstein seat seat was open, and uh, I said, you know what, let's run for the U.S. Senate. And uh, as any dutiful wife would do, she looked at me and smiled and turned over (laughs) and just woke up. And then about 10 (laughs) seconds later, she turned back and she looked at me. She said, don't you think you're a little young? (laughs) And I I said, at 75, I said, yeah, maybe. And then it reminded me of the, uh, the Reagan quote about, overcoming uh, his youth and, and inexperience, right? Yeah. And, uh, and it took us four months to see if there was a pathway for arguably the most difficult seat for a, a moderate in California. And, um, and we put together a great team, and there's a very narrow pathway, and we, we've stayed in our lane. And uh, we literally tied Schiff in the, uh, in the primary in the general election, and we beat him by 300,000 yeah. in the uh, temporary seat. So... Uh, even though there's a big disparity in registered Democratic voters to Republican, probably 28 percent, I think. Uh, and we we yep. knew that even though I, I got four million votes, that we'd probably start about 20 percent down if you just aggregate the votes, Democrat, Republican. But the uh, the tremendous momentum of people in California who, when I start talking about this malaise here, when you wake up in California and the weather is great, you look out and the mountains and the ocean, all these things, you do end up with this malaise that, oh, it'll get better tomorrow. Oh, well, the next election will get better. And it, it hasn't for over a generation now because it's been a one-party state. When you have a one-party state, you only have one voice. And that's why California is now that one shining state with all these great environmental virtues and great leaders in history has been a place where people are looking at and now saying, well, I wanted to go to California, but why have over a million people left there? And, uh, and then you start to explain to them regulations and, and all the things that have strangled businesses and technology. And when, when an Oracle leaves and, and when a Tesla leaves and, and uh, Chevron leaves, uh, it, it sends a tremendous wave of what's happening in California that that affects the the dining room table every morning, and uh, and and in corporate America and our positioning in the world where bad decisions are being made, and people look around the world at, at America every day, and when they see the the people struggling, 
in like in a great state like California, where 85% of the people every day are going to break even or lose money because of an economy and inflation that's strangling them and nobody's doing anything in the state and national level. So, um, so I'm running kind of with somebody, I don't need a brand. I've, I've got this name that people know. Steve Garvey 1.0 is the baseball player who, who uh, loved the fans. I never took the field for Democrats, uh, Republicans, independents. I took the field for all the fans. And now I'm the only candidate running for all the people because I have that relationship. And, uh, and we've got 80, 80 ish days now, and uh, we're going to win. I, I'm not sure how right now, <laughs> but I do know one thing the people are standing up and coming up to me every day and saying, Steve, thank you for running. Um, our prayers are with you. Uh, we too don't know how you're going to do this, but the big thing is uh, when a giant fan comes up to me and says, Garb, I, I hate the Dodgers. I'm voting for you. I think that's a huge step uh, on our way to, to the election. That, that is incredible. That is actually pretty incredible, Steve. Um, but it's interesting, like you, you talk about this uniparty in California, and I was talking about people looking the other way with regards to uh, Schiff. Um, I think this is what I, it, this all falls into what I categorize as the age of dumb. I feel like people aren't doing the legwork. There's an issue that I see with politicians here in New York City, for example, where they continue to implement the same policy over and over again. So it becomes a generational issue. For example, think in terms of um, low income housing communities like the projects here in New York City, where a lot of people would like to break out of the projects. They specialize, they're entrepreneurs, they want to open the next awesome restaurant, they want to open the next hair salon. But because New York City is so heavily regulated, they can't even open a retail shop. It's impossible. Yeah. Why don't politicians today try new things? Why aren't they willing to like break out and say, perhaps like for the underprivileged communities, we're going to deregulate so much to allow for them to break out of the inner city um, bind. And perhaps if some new businesses come out of it, all of that value for the local community will benefit the broader uh, community as it relates to quality of health care, quality of food and beyond. Um, it just seems like politicians keep going to the same playbook over and over again, Steve, across our whole country, uh, local, state and federal, and they're not trying new things. Why, why is there a reluctance for our politicians to uh, innovate? Yeah, right. Well, you hit it, the nail on the head, so to speak. Uh, it's about power and, and about money, about control. Uh, and, and you've seen this. This That's why I'm, I'm more concerned about an implosion from within in this country than I am from extraneous enemies around the world. And, uh, and if we don't, we start, don't start to unify and think of terms of the small business. And you mentioned that. America is built on small businesses. It's not built on... on and uh, corporate America that, uh, you know, is, is now valued at billions and trillions of dollars. It's built on small businesses where you have the chance to dream. And I always say about California, when you think about California back in the 70s when I first started, it was a place that was a heartbeat of America. You dreamed about coming to California, starting a small business, building, building the business and growing your family. Uh, the schools were, were great for the kids. They were going to get a great education, the next leaders of, of this country. And, uh, and over the years, when, you, when a one party takes over and starts to, uh, to do things like controlling education and, and making only a liberal education uh, the one thing that, that students hear, uh, then once this generation starts to take control, it's very difficult to get it back. Uh, and it takes political courage. And I talk about that. Uh, like I said before, uh, I'm at a wonderful time in my life. I've had a great life uh, to do this now. People have said, are you sane? You know, have you been tested properly? <laughs> and I said, I think so. I said, but I remember when in the 80s, early 80s, when I used to introduce President Reagan during his campaigns. Uh, and then I would go back, be invited back to the White House. And I remember one state dinner for the president of Ireland and uh, and getting the, the, the good fortune to sit at the president's table. Uh, and it was, I think, Mrs. O'Reilly from Ireland. And then it was Sandra Day O'Connor on one side and Maureen O'Hara on the other. I mean, what dates, wow. the greatest ever. Uh, and Brady, Amazing. who had been shot, you know, with when assassination of Tempon Reagan and Tip yeah. O'Neill. 
and uh, and to listen to Tip O'Neill and, and uh, President Reagan banter back and forth, and knowing that they were probably 180 degrees in, in ideology, but they were bantering mm-hmm. back and forth and kidding each other, and then knowing that these two guys were going to get together frequently and talk about what's good for the country, and they, the two of them, ide- ideology uh, opposed, were going to make America pretty doggone good in, in, in the 80s. And, and create a, a we can do this feeling of philosophy. And that's maybe the foundation of, of my campaign now is let's start getting people back together. I say, I've, I've said this, and people look at me. When I'm the next elected U.S. senator from California, the first thing I'll do is start to meet with the other 99 senators. I'll go to their office. It's going to take me, obviously, a few weeks or a couple months. And go in and stick my hand out and tell them, I want to work with you for the best interest of my state, your state, and this country. I think it's time. And I think I'll get an audience. I think people who don't know that much about Steve Garvey will want to sit down. And uh, because I've done something that's truly unique in political history is being a rookie and coming in and winning this U.S. Senate, uh, that they'll start to be a movement. But I, we I agree, need to I get agree, that conservative Steve. voice in there to to start to neutralize the uniparty in California. Yeah, I agree, Steve. So when you go in there and start meeting um, and trying to bring people back to the center a little bit, you know, it's funny, in looking at, at your platform, you have the ability to, in many ways, modernize the Republican Party, like your position as it relates to climate change and, um, you know, natural resources um, and other issues. They're, they're really, uh, really compelling. I'm sure that the constituency in California appreciates that, too. But would you start with you know, what people are talking about over the dinner table, their wallet, their bank account. I mean, right now, America's fiscal policy is problematic. Inflation is just hitting, you know, food and gasoline prices. Um, In California, it's even more difficult with regards to the regulations that are hitting. What would be your priority? Would you start with with the economy? Yeah, absolutely, Mark. Um, You know, when we first started uh, putting our policy together uh, last August, and we announced uh, October 10th. Obviously, never a good time to announce because the Israeli war broke out on the 7th. But we still were able to message to, I think, 15, 18 million people that I was running. Um, and there were 10 issues back then. And it was housing and health care and, and education. Uh, but the three that seemed to always percolate and, and start to rise to the top all the time uh, was crime, uh, the economy and inflation, and the border, uh, especially for border states like California. And uh, and now, you know, people will say abortion is the issue. Sure. But but the get up every day issues are those three. Uh, if you're not safe in your neighborhood, in your city, uh, or wherever you travel in this great country, then you're going to always be over, over looking over your shoulders thinking, can I do this or can I can I not do this? And that puts a restriction on on being an American and being able to have free will. Uh, then you get to, to the border and, and you realize, and, and I've been at the border a couple of different times now, uh, how literally a, a disaster it is. And that always oh, numbers 10 million, 12, 15, who knows, probably more uh, are coming across the, the border unvetted, uh, creating a fentanyl crisis like never before, human trafficking. Uh, the cartels have established uh, uh, presence in, in America. And all these then, then as, as we now become all border states, and as you know, uh, and even going back east and how, what a disaster Nor- New York is right now, that opening up the borders, and, and it was probably for the reason of, of uh, future votes and so forth, um, has been a disaster. So that, that takes you to the two issues of, of crime and safety, but getting up every day in, in this economy now with this inflation, and, and you get lied to every day. Well, it's down to 2.9. Well, that's good. But it was double digits for four years when you aggregate everything. And, right. uh, and it stifled free market capitalism uh, where small business is, can, can grow and survive. And that's our foundation there. Uh, when 1.2 million people have lost, left California, a lot of them have been small businesses that were pushed to the brink and they couldn't survive. So they had to leave California. Who would ever think a million people would leave California, this five state? Remarkable. But people can't yeah. survive there. Uh, from 
from 30 to 50 percent increase in in uh, in food to gas prices that are 35 percent up um, to inability to save uh, to the inability for people who who want to be able to have their golden years and be able to to have money to provide for those are now having to go back to work a year and a half after they retire. Teachers who spent right. 30 years in a position now having to uh, to go to work instead of being able to retire. But uh, we need to get back to that supply side, uh, that capitalism that gets money back into the uh, into uh, our society and allows people to make the decisions, not government. Uh, I believe that there is climate change, but I believe that the rush to to uh, this whole climate change platform uh, about doing away with gas and, and oil vehicles in 10 years uh, has caused an existential crisis. And, and that, and that all, whole economy has been, been driven by uh, what has been done to energy by turning off gas and oil. And that's caused ripple effect from, from transportation to commerce uh, to the kitchen table. So we've got to get back to, to common sense. Yeah, Steve, it's interesting. You mentioned a couple of things that I don't even think should be political footballs. Like, for example, when you mentioned fentanyl, my cousin's child died of a fentanyl overdose. And sure, he probably was messing around. But, you know, over 100,000 people over the past couple of years, 100,000 Americans have died of fentanyl. And, and arguably, it's coming through the southern border. Why is that a political issue? Isn't it really simple and common sense? Like, we don't want fentanyl coming in to poison our children, to poison in our people. Why is that a, a left and a right issue? Shouldn't it just be an area where everybody could come together and find common ground? Absolutely. It's a common sense, compassionate issue uh, that, that has become actually a, a, a civil war on the ground concerning uh, uh, the life and safety of, of American people. But it's happened because when you open your borders and you don't know who really is coming in, and when if you had 1,300 Chinese come in three years ago and you've got 33,000 coming in this year, is something wrong there? When Venezuela's crime is going down because their criminals have been re released out of prisons and, and sent to the United States to infiltrate this great country? Uh, human trafficking is, uh, is how many billion dollar business? And I hate to put it that way, but all these things are putting pressure on, on the United States when it shouldn't be and because of failed leadership, because of career politician doing exactly what you and I talked about, running for power, running for money, running for control. Um, and when you said before about, about my opponent, Adam Schiff, uh, two things I said in the first debate uh, when I was starting to become attacked. And when he said something about me and they started to go to another question, they said, excuse me, you know, when you're mentioned, you're allowed to rebuttal. And I said, uh, you, sir, Mr. Schiff, lied to 300 million people. You never be able to take that back. And 11 million, we got 11 million hits on, on social media. But I followed it up by what you said. Only one of a handful of, of congressmen ever to be censored in the history of Congress, in the history. So that's who I'm running against. Uh, somebody who blatantly lies, who is running for power, uh, and is supported by Aunt Nancy and Uncle George, Soros and Pelosi, and put out there. And it was only known, known for impeachment after 25 years. How powerful do you think Soros is specifically as it relates to California politics? I mean, it seems to me when I come to visit California, it's a mess. It doesn't matter if I'm in San Francisco, Union Square is like shut down. There are people all over the streets doing drugs out in the open. Same thing in Los Angeles. I go to Los Angeles and some of the most beautiful neighborhoods are just, you know, covered with um, garbage and, and um, homelessness. And it's really, really uh, spun out of control. Is that a lot because of George Soros? Oh, I think he's probably an influence. You know, he chooses to use his money um, and a lot of money uh, to put candidates in that have the same ideology, which is uh, detrimental to the to our to our cities and, and and states in this country. But it's more than just him. But he's most significant, probably, and the and the ability to pump enough money in to make two relatively unknown uh, politicians to take the, the progressive Democrat in political position so that eventually you'll have, like we're talking about, this one-party state in, in, in California. Um, you don't want to believe it, 
we don't want to believe that money makes the difference, but in a uh, probably in a presidential race this year that'll be over a billion dollars spent, a billion dollars on a political amazing. race. Um, it's amazing is going to be amazing, you know. And I, you know, Mark, I've got uh, I've got one hundred and fifty thousand small donors, which is just amazing. And, and my friends right. in, in Congress who've been around 10, 15, 20 years say that that's unheard of. But I've gotten people to stand up and say, remember the movie Network? And Peter Finch was of the course. aging uh, uh, anchor who was being thrown out and he's waving a gun and the producer says, this is great reality TV. <laughs> and he said, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. And I think the people of California and the people of this country have reached that point now where they're mad as hell. And uh, I think you'll see it on November 5th and throughout the voting in October. Steve, one last question. Um, I know you, I know you're short for time, but um, you mentioned October 7th and we're about to get back into um, college, you know, college kids are returning to campus. I think in fact that there was just a ruling with regards to UCLA in particular blocking Jewish kids on campus and all. Um, do you anticipate that these pro Hamas movements on college campuses are going to start just like clockwork come September? Yeah, two things. Uh, number one, I, I, I said I would always uh, be truthful uh, to the people. And, and the second was I will always go where answers needed to be uh, needed to be heard. So it was I've gone to the border. I've gone to the inner cities. I've done ride along. And I also went to Israel for a week at the end of June to see really what had happened there uh, up close and personal and um, and to talk to the intelligence and the generals and leadership there. And uh, they always say, when you go back to Israel, it's life-changing. And even though I'm a man of faith, it truly was. Because the first day we went to where the atrocities happened at the kibbutz right near the border of, uh, with Gaza there. And then the uh, music festival, Nova, where 3,500 young men and women uh, were attacked by Hamas that early morning at about 6.30. It was a, a 6 to 6 uh, concert. Uh, and to see um, the genocide and how they were massacred, uh, and to listen to uh, to the Israeli leadership and to the people, how strong those people are, so that with all the things that are going on, the unrest on campuses now, and the attack, the pro-Palestinian attack on on um, on Jews and on the campuses, uh, and I call it a hate crime. I did a press conference in in Beverly Hills with Rabbi Mentz and Aaron Cohen, who's uh, anti-terrorist, uh, no. and uh, nobody wants to say that. But when you attack Jewish students on campus, uh, that's a hate crime, uh, and nobody said that. And and in talking with um, a hostage negotiator in Israel, and to hear him say that their intelligence says that within 48 hours after the war started on October 7th, a hundred colleges and universities were activated in the United States. Uh, with financial support, uh, with a, uh, a playbook, so to speak, on how to infiltrate those campuses and start this attack on, on, uh, on, on Israel, on the Jews, and on these, on these students. And I said in the first debate, and I've been steadfast, I stand with Israel yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I think we should be there for every need they may, may have, but we could never tell them that they can't protect their sovereignty uh, and their ability to protect their history and their people. And, uh, and my opponent, even though he says he's Jewish, uh, has asked for a, a ceasefire, which I don't think that uh, will ever happen or never could happen. Uh, and he didn't vote for a, an armaments package about, uh, about two months ago. So you have to stand by what the fiber of your faith is. And, uh, and even though I'm Catholic, uh, I have a number of Jewish friends, and I stand by the uh, one of our great uh, allies in Israel, and our single outpost, really, in the Middle East, that's protecting democracy. So Schiff voted against the armament package for Israel and also asked for a ceasefire. When he asked for a ceasefire, did he ask for the hostages to be released, too? Well, it was part of that whole progressive movement that's uh, that's taken over the Democratic Party. And I have you know, a number of Democratic friends, moderate friends, who are just... Uh, they're swimming in a progressive ideology that, that doesn't let the, the Democratic Party, which I think if you go back to Reagan when he was a Democrat, or basically moderate Democratic uh, uh, policies now, and of course he switched over to, to being a conservative, yeah. uh, that would work. 
and really work for both parties. Um, but but I think we have to get back to uh, to taking care of those that uh, that are part of of uh, who America is, our allies. And like I said before, when we've been to the Hoover Institute, uh, they've convinced me, and it didn't take long, that we've never been in more danger by our adversaries around the world. Never have we been so spread thin because we're helping all of ours, uh, but that we we now have to band together and uh, and carry that torch for democracy throughout the world. Steve, all of my guests end the show um, in a similar way. What I do is I lead them. The name of the show is Some Future Day. It's a James Joyce reference. And I start with that um, at the beginning. And then I let my guest uh, finish the sentence for me. Are you game? Uh, sure. Right off the cuff. Huh? Okay. You're a gamer anyway, so you got to be game. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We, we use a lot of baseball terms in my campaign. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, um, I'm going to lob this one in for you. It's going to be a softball pitch. All right. Oh. In some future day, when Steve Garvey takes that Californian Senate seat, America will be. America will be ignited uh, by a voice that truly is for all the people. Somebody who, uh, who never judges, but only uh, listens to people uh, and and wants the very best. You know, um, life is God's gift to us, and what we, with our gift to Him, is how we treat other people and and how we represent Him. And uh, I think when it's all said and done, uh, hopefully people will look back and say Steve Garvey made a difference. Steve, that's really beautiful. And I, I know you referenced before that you're a religious person, you're a religious man. I, I, I was studying before our interview, and I heard you say that one of the most inspirational people in your life was Pope Paul. And um, I thought that was really very nice, too. It really does exemplify kind of who you are as a person. So thank you so much for um, joining me today in this fantastic discussion, Steve. I only wish you and your family all the best. Thank you so much. I know your time is very important, so thank you so much for joining me today. For ongoing insights surrounding these important topics, you can join the conversation on my social media channels, including Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn, at Mark Beckman. And to sign up for my newsletter on Substack, you can find me at markbeckman.substack.com. To make sure you don't miss a show, be sure to subscribe to Some Future Day across all major platforms worldwide, including YouTube, Spotify, and Apple. Special thanks to New York University for producing Some Future Day, and a big shout out to my producer extraordinaire, John Boomhofer, for being patient and always encouraging me to push through. Thanks a lot, John. Have a great day.